G'day everybody, my name's Alex Bainbridge from Greenneft and I'd like to welcome you to this latest episode of the Greenneft Show. Today we're going to be talking about the Victorian elections which are fast approaching at the end of this month. Before we do, I do want to make an acknowledgement that we are recording this show on stolen Aboriginal land. Someone actually asked recently why do we, why do we even make this acknowledgement. I think it's very important that we recognise that this country, Australia, was stolen land. There were people living here before the, uh, the British invaders came and they colonised someone else's land. That land was never ceded. It was never lost in battle. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land, and we pay respects to the traditional owners, and we pledge our ongoing support for campaigns for justice for First Nations people. Before we do get started with this show, I also wanted to let you know, if you like the work that we do, please become a Green F supporter. We're actually on a supporter drive at the moment, so nothing would make us happier than if you uh, would actually sign up and become a supporter today. If you're already a supporter, please invite a friend to come and help out as well. It makes a big difference. Plans start for just $5 a month, and it just is critical to, to us being able to continue the work that we do. It's also the best way to get the content that we produce. So as I said, it makes a big difference. You can also support us on Patreon. Um, there are links in the description for both ways that you can help us uh, and also However you're um, getting this video or podcast, please give the video or the podcast a thumbs up. It makes a big difference. As I said, we're going to be discussing the Victorian elections, which are coming up on 26th of November. Uh, the, Daniel, the Daniel Andrews government is likes to present itself as a progressive government, and certainly you can't look at the conservative media without seeing the very obvious attacks that the, the right uh, makes against the, the Andrews government. At the same time, the Labor Party in Victoria has been racked with corruption scandals and they do have a number of dodgy policies. So I'm here with two, uh, two candidates in the election from Socialist Alliance to actually unpack this election and what it means. Firstly, I'm here with Sue Bolton. She is a councillor with Mary Beck Council, used to be known as the um, Moreland Council, and she's also the Socialist Alliance candidate for Pascoe Vale. I'm also here with Sarah Hathaway. Uh, she is a a uh, trade union organiser in the health sector, and she's also the social science candidate for Lara. So thank you, welcome to Sarah and Sue. Uh, we'll get underway, and I'd just like to ask, first of all, um, as I said, the Andrews government presents itself as progressive, but um, but the, you know, there's, there's more to the story than that. Can you please start, Sue, by just telling us uh, how do you see the Andrews government and the political situation in Victoria more generally? So I think the... Uh, idea that's been put around by the Andrews government that it is the most progressive government in Australian history, um, that's actually said by some of the ALP candidates, is totally misplaced. Um, it has been quite a clever government. It has done um, some things uh, as a nod towards the left and progressive politics, support for equal marriage, um, safe injecting rooms, um, you know, abortion rights and, and a few of and the treaty process now. But at the same time, its um, budget this year, its state budget, kept public sector workers' um, wage cap at 1.5%. Um, it's so they, you know, they actively use police against picket lines. Um, they've introduced environmental laws, uh, punitive environmental laws to criminalise uh, protests in the forest, including citizen scientists um, who might go out to the forest where, they, where logging is planned, where they suspect there might be endangered animals. And that very fact of going out into the forest to count uh, endangered species like the greater glider or the lead beater's possum can um, carry a jail sentence and extraordinarily high fines. Um, so it's been criminalised, basically. Um, the government has pursued a law and order agenda, mm -hmm. so it's kept on going with the militarisation of the police, which, you know, it's got in common with the Liberal Party. Um, but also it's been a very privatising government. Um, it's privatised many things from the Port of Melbourne to the... Um, uh, to Vic, parts of Vic Roads and the Land Titles Office. And it's also been part of, along with the Liberal Party, of giving massive handouts to the big toll road companies, which is really just a corporate handout. 
Thanks for that, Sue. Uh, any comments from you, Sarah, about how you see the Andrews government and the political situation more generally? Yeah, without repeating everything that Sue said, I think they're very good at window dressing or pink washing or purple washing or um, however you want to refer to it. But I think at the heart of it, they are quite conservative, um, both economically um, and, you know, in terms of law and order. Um, and that was, you know, without rehashing two years of COVID, that was really apparent through COVID where you saw just how heavy handed um, the police response was, particularly in Victoria. And there was a lot of elements to that, but probably one of the most concerning was the use of rubber bullets um, on protesters, you know, not left and progressive, um, but any any use of rubber bullets with protesters, we should all be concerned about. Um, and just, you know, the, the thing that is on my mind now is that they've been in government for eight years. Like, it's not good enough now, eight years down the track, where it's not just a, a matter of funding, but we've got deep structural problems in health and education that they haven't reviewed and haven't addressed. And now eight years in, they'll, oh, we'll look into that. Or this is the first time we're hearing about this problem. Um, and it's just a cop out. And we're hearing that from local ALP um, MPs down here in Geelong. Back to you, Sue. I'd just like to ask, why is the Social Science running and what are you hoping to achieve out of this campaign? We are wanting to run to put clear left-wing uh, socialist perspective forward. We want to put forward working class policies. Um, there are so many um, neoliberal policies that are being put forward by Labor dressed up as being progressive. We want to expose um, the inadequ total inadequacy of uh, the policies of the Labor Party, but from a working class perspective. There are some massive social issues that are happening. I don't think it's too much, it's not an exaggeration to say we've got the worst housing crisis in Victoria and around Australia since the 1930s. And all the governments are doing is tinkering around at the edges. Meanwhile, there are people who do have a lot of money. Um, so, some of the biggest corporations, some of them are energy uh, companies, some of them are the big toll road companies, some of, some of them are companies like Crown Casino that have a lot of money that are not paying taxes, um, who are getting away with pocketing huge amounts of money. Um, there are all sorts of companies that are profiting out of public-private partnerships uh, with the state Labor government and previously the Liberal Party government. We need to put forward alternative socialist solutions to these issues and working class solutions. Um, we just can't get let them get away with uh, trying to blame the victims for the cost of living crisis or the housing crisis. I think that's what the major parties do. They try and individualise the responsibility for the crisis. And at the moment for ordinary working class people, there's um, a cost of living crisis because the companies are just jacking up the prices because they can get away with it. Then there's an income crisis because um, various levels of government are keeping a lid on people's incomes. Um, that's both state and federal with job seeker being the worst situation, uh, but also, you know, other workers, minimum wage workers, et cetera. But then also the massive housing crisis, which is not being treated as an emergency by the by the government. Thanks for that. Um, turning to you, Sarah, I wanted to ask specifically about the health system. Uh, we're two and a half years into the pandemic, uh, and the, the health system has obviously been under a lot of strain. Can you talk about the issues in in the health and and what the left is demanding? How long have we got? No, I could spend two hours just on that health. Um, yeah, look, there's there's clearly a funding issue. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of announcements and particularly in Victoria, we're seeing a lot of infrastructure announcements. So new hospital here, new hospital there, um, expanding beds here. Um, and it's very, to, I don't want to sound cynical, but to me, it's very um, soundbite oriented leading up to an election um, and really at the heart of this is that we've got a staffing shortage crisis 
and I will use the word crisis. Um, you know, I recently just completed some placement um, at my local public health service and they were announcing every week the number of empty shifts or vacant shifts they couldn't fill. And we're in the, we're in the hundreds um, and there's nurses working 12 hour shifts. Like we are at crisis point and it feels like for the last two years, we've been saying we're at crisis point and it just gets worse and worse and you can't think it can possibly get any worse and it just escalates. Um, so, I mean, there's been some steps in the right direction with that in terms of um, uh, announcements around funding courses for nurses, but, you know, it's not just nurses that work in hospitals. This crisis is across all disciplines, um, and particularly I want to fly, fly the flag for the allied health um, discipline, so physio, OT, social worker. Um, and, and that gets to the other point, too, that our Department of Health and the bureaucrats and the health minister there's either a, a deliberate avoidance or ignorance of how the health system works. So there's all this talk about ambulance ramping and bed blocking. So that's when the ambulances get stuck at ED because there's no beds in ED and there's no beds up on the wards. But there's still no understanding that you need allied health in there to do the discharge. It's allied health that gets people in, treated and discharged out of the hospital. Um, so even when they are throwing money, it's going to all the wrong spots. Um, the other big issue too is the, um, I guess, fragmentation and corporatization of our health system. So we call it public health. Um, it's publicly funded and we've notionally got a Department of Health. Um, but in Victoria, we're in the mid-70s in terms of separate entities or organisations that are public health services. Each entity has its own board, its own CEO, and they operate as their own little fiefdom. And so you can just imagine how and why it was so chaotic through COVID, um, where up until that point, you'd had a Department of Health that had been completely hands off. And then all of a sudden, they're trying to coordinate a pandemic response with like 75 different health services um, and that still hasn't been addressed. So what are the solutions we should be campaigning for? Uh, completely restructured, like actually, you know, operating public health like public health, this, this corp corporatized model um, is a failure. And we are starting to see amalgamations, um, particularly in the regional health services, there's been amalgamations of health services. Um, the Department of Health needs to have more authority as a department to issue directions. So um, I've sp spent some time working for a health union and we, we constantly have been told by the health department, oh, we, we can advise, we can't direct. And it's like, well, why do we have a Department of Health at a government level if you can't direct our public health service, you know, in terms of what PPE to put in and that kind of thing? Um, funding's definitely an issue. Um, and the other thing in terms of our campaign platform is that we're not going to make public health attractive to people unless the wages improve. Um, there's been a 2% wages cap, which is appalling. So we're asking our public sector healthcare workers to take a pay cut in the face of inflation. Um, but we also need to address unpaid placement. Um, and again, you know, I've just done a thousand hours of unpaid placement. It sucks. Um, and for every health profession, be it nurses or allied health, it's hundreds of hours of giving up potentially paid work to come and do unpaid placement. And it's just not sustainable. People are getting to the second or third year of their degree and exiting because they can't afford to do it. Sue mentioned earlier about the privatising policies of the Andrews government. Uh, yet one thing we've heard recently is this new policy to restore a, uh, a public uh, state electricity commission. I think, Sarah, you've written about this recently. Could you please talk to us about this policy, the good and the bad of it, and, uh, and yeah, your, your assessment? Yeah, I think to start with the positives first is definitely, I think, a step in the right direction. Um, I think it is a nod to the failures of privatisation um, and a recognition that 
you know, there's this message that we've heard, particularly from the, the federal liberals um, for some time, is that somehow the free hand of the market or capital is going to address the climate crisis and we're just going to have this magic transition to renewables. Um, so that is the positive. Um, I guess part of the frustration is that the revived SEC, um, the way it's being touted by some sections of the union movement and the Victorian ALP is that the SEC is back um, as it was, like, before my time, before I was born, sorry, um, but it's not back. Like, it's not back in that scale of government department where there were hundreds of public sector jobs, apprenticeships, um, that kind of thing. Um, and our understanding, and it's largely how public sector works, is that there'll be a government office, which they're going to set up in Morwell in the, in the Latrobe Valley, um, but they will tend to out projects. So it's still um, a PPP or a public-private partnership with all tender out all these projects renewables. Um, and so there's still going to be this tension between unions and private enterprise in terms of wages and conditions. We're still going to be having fights about apprenticeship ratios because at the end of the day, it's not going to be public sector operated. We're just going to be handing out public money. Um, so, you know, there's definitely an opportunity now. I think this is a wedge for unions and climate activists to, to push this further and say, great, we've got some semblance of the SEC back, but let's go for 100% publicly owned and operated and stop this tendering um, process. Uh, Sue, do you have anything you wanted to add on this? I think this is very superficial. Um Sarah is right. This is, um, there is a lot of window dressing in this. I mean, of course, it is good that um, as far as it goes, this announcement about a revived SEC, but it is not the old SEC. It is not 100% publicly owned. It is only going to be 51% publicly owned. So it's a public private partnership in reality. And it's only with regard to the generation. The old SEC was a complete entity. It included all aspects of electricity, generation, distribution, et cetera. Um, you know, after the privatisation of the SEC, it was divided up into um, different components um, in generation, transmission, uh, distribution, and retail. That was all one integrated entity. That is not what is coming back. So it'll still be a competitive scenario. And then also it will be competing in an energy market in the um, Australian energy market. So it's not really what we want. We want electricity um produced, generated uh, according to need, the need of the community and on the basis of renewable energy. It needs to be distributed in a safe way, an equitable way, and there needs to be a lid on prices. Um, uh, there needs to be a cap on prices. And it looks like they're most likely leaving the retail in the hands of the private sector or some collaboration with the private sector. Um, so this is not good enough. Um, there are a large number of retail companies and you pretty much need a science degree to read the bills. And um, you know they encourage you to shop around for lower prices, but really they're all charging much of a muchness. And that's, uh, you know, that's where we really need a cap. We need a proper government enterprise. Can I just add, sorry, to this too, that the other contradiction, when they announced the SEC, um, Victoria has also revised their renewable energy targets and their emission reduction targets, um, which in the context of where we've been at are now quite ambitious. And I, I won't, I think it was something like 80% emission reduction by 2035. I hope I've got that right off the top of my head. Um, but the contradiction to that is in Geelong, we've been fighting a campaign for two years um, to oppose uh, Victorian state government planning approvals for a gas import terminal. 
Um, we're now three weeks out from a state election and we've been told that the government won't give us an answer on this until after the election. It, like, it's a what if they got to hide? Um, so that's that's really frustrating that our community is going into vote with no certainty over this project. Um, and the other concern is that if they do approve this gas import terminal, um, it's very likely that it will actually blow these emission reduction targets out of the water. We we can't see how that is achievable. Um, and if Fever's project gets knocked off, there's another one. So there's VOPAC, which is the exact same thing down the line. Um, so it, it it's, is a very um, contradiction and the government needs to be refusing all these gas projects. Um, they're doing seismic testing um, along the southeast coast, so they can't sort of do some greenwashing over here with one hand and then keep going with these fossil fuel projects with the other. So you mentioned earlier about the housing crisis, and I'm wondering if you can make further comments on the housing crisis and the cost of living crisis, and especially what does Social Science uh, say we should be doing about this? Well, I think the housing crisis is the biggest part of the cost of living crisis, although not the only part of the cost of living crisis. I think, you know, Australia spends um, a very tiny percentage on social housing and, you know, compared to the UK, I think Australia only spends something like 4 or 5% compared to the UK spending something like 17 to 20%. But then within that 4 or 5%, the percent that is actual public housing is very tiny um, and then we've also got a lack of renter protections in Australia we don't have rent caps we don't have rent sec rental security um, so all of that uh, makes housing very expensive and then on top of that we have um many years ago, the, the state development agency was privatised. And so now land developers can get away with land banking, manipulating the market to drive up the cost of land in order to drive up the cost of housing. So the you know, housing doesn't necessarily need to be this exp as expensive as it is. Um, it, you know, it's being driven that way by the speculators. Um, we need, you know, at least 100,000 dwellings built within five years, but public dwellings, proper public dwellings. The Victorian government has a housing big build program, um, but in reality, all of those that housing uh, that is supposedly public is actually going to be run by community housing providers which are, which are only obligated to take 75% of people from the priority waiting list um, for public housing. So it's, and they prefer to charge market rent or slightly less than market rent um, to people who are, on, who are working full time. Um, and so there's a massive crisis and that, you know, this um, reliance by the federal and state government on community housing is not going to solve, not going to solve that. We need proper public housing built. We need, um, we need a cap on rents. We need inclusionary zoning where it's mandatory for developers to include affordable housing within their developments so that affordable housing isn't used uh, as a form of horse trading with local councils in order to get extra hide. Um, and we, um, we also need to address the cost of living crisis as well. I mean, probably what we actually need is a people's bank um, where there can be low cost loans to people um, but then there's also a need to address people's incomes and I think especially we need to put a lid on the increasing cost of gas and electricity. Looks like Sue might have been cut off there although probably not a bad finish but any final comments from you Sarah? Yeah just on housing um, it, sort of in the heart of the electorate where we're running is Norlane and Corio um, and Norlane I think is in the top three postcodes in Victoria of like most socioeconomically disadvantaged so it does feel like we're right on the pointy end here um, 
And it's interesting, like there's big slabs of like pockets of public housing that are, are just so run down and then you'll cross a street and it's like a whole new housing estate um, and there's a lot of gentrification um, happening in the northern suburbs at the moment um, and a lot of empty blocks. Um, so, again, where I am, all the housing in this area was built for the old Ford factory workers in the 60s, so it's quite... Um, run down like shitty fibro housing that's falling apart and those houses are all starting to get knocked down but if you drive around at the moment there's just empty block after empty block that developers are sitting on houses aren't being built um the public housing that's out here is just left um there's you know a public housing unit around the corner from me that I think burnt down during COVID or partially burnt down during COVID and nearly three years later, they're just starting to rebuild that now. So, um, and meanwhile, we know, as Sue mentioned, the waiting list out here is extremely long. Um, the other interesting thing down here is we're hosting the Commonwealth Games in 2026. Um, and we've been talking to locals about that because history shows that we've got all these um infrastructure builds we need to build for the Commonwealth Games. We're going to have a big influx of workers to build that infrastructure and where are they going to live? Um, and the big concern is they're going to price out um, all the locals and the last kind of affordable suburbs in Geelong won't be affordable anymore. Um, so we have been talking to people about um, like a rent freeze or a cap for existing residents um, so that locals don't all get pushed out over the next four years as we get ready for the Commonwealth Games. And yet we've got Sue back. Any final comments from you, Sue? I think one thing which we need to do is that we need to reverse privatisation in Victoria, but we also need to reverse the models that were introduced by Kennett, which have been maintained by successive Liberal and Labor governments which is to treat not only hospitals, but schools as their own little um, private enterprises. Because mm. uh, that's one of the problems with schools, all the problems we're seeing with hospitals, with the triple, triple zero emergency centre, which is grossly understaffed and is operating as a private business, although funded by the state government, and not enough money to employ enough trained staff. I mean, that's why we've had situations happen with um, people dying because ambulances are not getting to them in time. Um, but we've got the, exactly the same situation happening in schools where, um, you know, teachers are leaving in droves because they're overworked, um, overworked, understaffed, and not enough pay for the job. And in, we're seeing that in hospitals, there's no money being allocated to community health, to uh, like which is preventative health, to prevent people uh, to solve health issues before it gets to an emergency where people have to go to an emergency department. Um, there's so many issues. And the problem is all of these systems are set up in um, terms of competition between either private companies providing essential services for people or between private companies such as uh, these dodgy private training organisations competing against public TAFEs and that whole system of market, um, competitive market which includes profit gouging and uh, substandard service and money uh, you know, these organisations, these private organisations are funded by the state, but then a, a section of that money that comes from the state, which comes from us as ordinary people, um, is then uh, taken as profit by these companies providing essential services. We need to reverse that whole system so that the system can be based on social need, social and environmental need. Um, our slogan for social science in this election is community need, not corporate greed. I think that's absolutely apt. We want to really try and build a movement uh, to resist these sort of uh, terrible economic policies, 
um, terrible policies which are destroying the environment as well. Um, but we can only really do that not just by standing in the elections and hopefully getting elected, but also through organising. And if we got elected, we'd have the same approach that we have on council or that I've had on council where I've seen my role as a union delegate where you organise people to um, have a bigger voice, a collective voice for their rights. And on that basis, I've actually had some victories on council, despite only being one vote on council. And because everything that's been progressive in this country, whether it's workers' rights or women's rights or any other form of rights, have always been won outside of parliament, on the streets, through industrial action and various community campaigns. And it's really only at the end of the day that the politicians might grant um, grant a right to people. So um, in standing for the elections, we're, sta we're saying that we still think grassroots community organising is absolutely critical to winning on the issues that we're proposing in this election. And so we want to help build that movement um, both uh, outside of parliament and if we get elected we'll, we'll magnify the voice and the influence of these movements. Well thank you both of you thanks Sarah and Sue uh, thanks for joining us and thank you to you for watching this episode of the Green Left Show. As I said before if you like the work that we do please become a supporter it is the best way to support the work that we do and it is uh, yeah the best way to get the content that we produce. You can also help us out simply just by giving this video or this podcast a thumbs up, um, sharing it with your friends, giving us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or um, you know, commenting on the YouTube. How are you getting this, con this, uh, this episode of the Green Air Show? Please, uh, please share it and help us build the audience. And like I said, even just for free, the thumbs up on the video or the podcast makes a big difference. If you do want to support us through Patreon, you can, uh, you can find us there. There's a link in the description and we'd love to have your support. Uh, thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.